And now, we would like to start session four on global liquidity and policy challenges. The moderator for this session is Mr. Zhang Nok Schneider, Deputy Director at OECD. Mr. Schneider, speakers, and the discussions for session four. Could you please forward um, the session? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to moderate this session. Uh, uh, to cover the, the narrow field announced by the title of, uh, of this session, that is Global Liquidity Policy Challenges, Past, Present, Future, uh, we have two distinguished speakers. Uh, the first one is Jean-Pierre Landau from Sciences Po Paris, formerly Banque de France, and uh, the second one, uh, Douglas Gale from New York University. And we have two discussants, uh, Akito Matsumoto from the IMF and Timothy Lane from the Bank of Canada. Uh, would you start, Jean-Pierre? Thank you very much. I, I, I want to thank the, uh, the Bank of Korea for having me again uh, this year after, next, uh, after last year. I want to thank all my friends in this institution and I especially want to thank uh, Governor Kim, who's been uh, extremely kind to me in uh, many circumstances. Uh, and just before we went into this meeting, Governor Kim told me that he considered me as a philosopher as much as an economist, which I take as a compliment and which uh, makes me feel easier to speak after the general manager because speaking after the general manager is, is, is both a blessing because you still bask in his glory and a curse because you difficulty to match his, uh, his, uh, his performance. So um, I'm going to present a very few general reflections on, uh, on global liquidity, building on, on the many works which have been done uh, here and there, including on some presentation yesterday. And what I would think I could add a little bit in, uh, in that deep discussion is to add a new perspective, which I took from uh, many papers by Maury Opsfeld. And in one of those papers, he made the case that we should look at the world as a single financial system, not as a single country, but as a single financial system. And if you look at the world as a single financial system, uh, you walk away from a question of what's the cause, what's the effect, what's the source, what's the consequences, and you just try to look at how the system behaves when it's uh, affected or hit by shocks. What are the amplification mechanisms? What are the feedback loops? And of course, you also have to look at the structure of the system itself because the way it behaves depends on its structure. So uh, that's what I'm going to try and do, in a, in a, uh, again, in a very broad and general manner and to see how global liquidity help us as a concept uh, to describe the behavior of the, the international financial system seen again as a financial system and with the classic distinction between uh, private liquidity and official liquidity. Uh, in, the, in, uh, in passing, uh, I will take some two specific lessons which I personally took from the, from the euro crisis on those issues. So the dynamic, dynamics of private liquidity is very, very well known. They have been uh, very well described uh, in many presentations yesterday, especially by Bob McCauley and Governor Choi. Uh, I think that they gave a lot of evidence, numbers, and data which, uh, which uh, substantiate the few, uh, the very few things I'm going to hear. There is, of course, and uh, just as in domestic liquidity and international liquidity, we have that kind of reciprocal relationship between risk and liquidity. Uh, when risk aversion is low, liquidity is low, is high. Uh, and the fact that having high liquidity uh, encourages uh, low risk aversion and so on. And this is very well documented by a very strong correlation between the VIX uh, index and credit and portfolio flows. So the correlation between VIX and credit is in the CGFS report, and the correlation between the VIX and portfolio flows is in a paper by, uh, by Bob McCauley, which is called Risk on Risk Off, and it shows exactly the same kind of correlation. It's very, it's very interesting. If we look at private liquidity as a, its own private dynamic, we, we, we have three striking factors. The fact is that there may be aggregate shocks. And my own perspective is that there is no way to explain what happened in the world economy after Lehman uh, if we don't look at it as an aggregate liquidity shock across the world. Um, there is no way of explaining why there was such a drop and such a synchronized drop in GDP in all countries 
instantaneously by traditional so-called contagion channels. So it has to be seen as, a, as an aggregate shark. Uh, people would say a confidence shark, I would say a liquidity shark. Everybody started holding liquidity and that created a drop, uh, an, an autonomous demand on, uh, on liquidity and that created a drop in GDP. Also, if you look at liquidity from, I mean, kind of traditional perspective, there are discontinuities, there are regime changes, we can shift from risk on, risk off mode, and these changes in risk aversion, which we are not able to either identify, often explain, and let alone, let alone anticipate, they uh, trigger liquidity moves and self-fulfilling uh, changes. Uh, what I would tend to say is that we see long, as far as credit banking is concerned, we see kind of long credit cycle going on several years, and then a change in regime and then credit collapse or, or diminishes. And it seems to me that our experience in the last two, three years is that portfolio flows, portfolio flow go through shorter credit cycles. And we had periods in between 2010 and now where you had uh, uh, risk on and risk off uh, shifts in terms of portfolio flows to emerging economies, which complicated enormously uh, the macro management in those countries. Although, as uh, the general manager has said, the general trend is clear. It's, uh, it's an increase in risk, of, uh, a decrease in risk aversion in international loan market. And then, of course, obviously, uh, this plays an amplifying factor when we have small differences in either perceived or realized monetary stances then uh, the risk uh, liquidity spiral uh, starts moving on and that explains, of course, the development and unwinding and carry trades. So all this is very kind of classical and traditional. <coughs> what I think is interesting and would deserve maybe some further research is looking at the structure of the financial system itself. I said it's a single financial system, but it's by no means a homogeneous one. It's actually, actually very heterogeneous. So if we look at the heterogeneities in the financial system, uh, we see three of them. The first one is the asymmetries in financial development and structure. So it's pretty clear that not all the countries have achieved the same level of financial deepening, uh, both in bond and equity market. It's pretty clear that the health of the banking sector is not the same uh, in all countries. So in some countries, we have very solid, robust, and well-capitalized banking sectors in others. Uh, we, have, uh, we have different situations. And the consequence of that is, of course, what I would call, I mean, yesterday somebody mentioned the paper by Borio about elasticity of the financial system, which I think is a very illuminating factor, uh, term and concept. But this elasticity is actually, in my view, very different according to countries, uh, according to the health of the financial system and according to the structure of their financial markets. So one major problem in the dynamics of the world financial system is that the same monetary or liquidity impulse may have on domestic economy very differentiated impact according to the health of the system and the, deepen, uh, the, the, the deepening of the financial market. And that's something we learn, <laughs> I would say, with great pain in the euro area because we have one single monetary policy and very different banking sectors in terms of their structure and their, uh, their robustness. And so we, we, we have that problem. <laughs> we, we saw that problem. And uh, I think I was not aware of that problem until I saw it developing so much in the, in the, um, in the Euro area. And that, in my view, is a very uh, pertinent approach to macro credential measures uh, and to uh, broad view of what should be the banking and financial union in the Euro area. It should make sure that uh, with one monetary, single monetary policy, we can adjust and have uh, that monetary policy producing the desired effect in very different financial structure. That's what my, uh, my mentor and colleague at Princeton, Marcus Pronomaya, called optimizing the euro, uh, the optimum currency area. And I think in terms of global liquidity, we should think the same. We should optimize the world financial system, and that's how we should look at macroprudential policy. The second, of course, consequences, and I will not elaborate very much, is that it's currency segmented, and so, Depending, and uh, I think the general manager made that, made that case in many of his speeches, there are price effects and quantity effects on global liquidity movement. And my guess is that the price quantity split depends on the structure of financial system, whether the assets are substitutable or not, whether the financial markets is developed or not. And I would say the bigger the substitution effect, the broader the financial, domestic financial market, and the less the exchange rate has to take the burden of the adjustment in relative price, asset prices across, across countries. Uh, 
Uh, and that may explain why uh, different countries have different exchange rate volatility, again, in the same global liquidity and monetary environment. Uh, so exchange rate can be very volatile depending on the financial structure. And they, uh, I think there is consensus now that there's a weak in salentic properties of exchange rate for many reasons which also have been developed in the general manager uh, last speeches last year. Uh, and also in paper by, uh, by Yong Shin, which found a very interesting mechanism according to which an exchange rate appreciation self-feeds because it increases the credit worthiness of those domestic intermediaries which are indebted in foreign currencies and have assets in local currencies. So it creates spontaneous capital flows which self-feed with the exchange rate appreciation. And the last element of segmentation, I will not develop that much in, in presence of uh, Gary Gordon, but we don't have cross-border collateral. So that's a big difference in terms of global liquidities allocated across the world as compared as uh, how liquidity is allocated inside a domestic economy. So it's a single financial system, but it's a single financial system which is segmented in many ways and heterogeneous in many ways. What can we say about the impact of monetary policies on that? And uh, the point we made in our CGFS report is that the second factor, apart from risk taking, which influences global liquidity flows and behavior and dynamics, is monetary policies. I think I would put a case, a little bit provocative, that the channel of transmission of unconventional monetary policies are not basically different from the one of conventional monetary policy. And you have the four channels which are enumerated here. But they may be stronger in some regards. So the first point on which they may be stronger, I think, not so much, a lot of the discussion has been, has been, has been focused on the LSAPs. And actually, I think the forward guidance may have a much bigger effect in terms of transmission effect than the else apps. Because forward guidance gives you a, a total elimination of rollover risk for those of us who want to take uh, cross-border exposure in currencies. And, uh, and I think that, that, that moves considerably the balance of incentives in taking carry trades. So forward guidance may be more important and deserve more attention when we look at, uh, at the transmission mechanism of foreign policy than else apps. And of course, zero interest rates between the, uh, uh, the major advanced countries uh, create an determination exchange rate because exchange rates only depend on risk premium. So you have two forces there. And the point maybe I would, uh, my conjecture, is that those forces cancel themselves to a point between advanced countries. Because advanced countries, you have a determination of exchange rate and increase incentive of carry trade, but of course, carry trade become more dangerous if exchange rates are undetermined. Whereas between advanced and emerging economies, then the incentives are pretty clear for developing carry trade. And so that explains why maybe advanced economies are not so worried about the transmission effect of non commercial policy and why uh, emerging economies might be more worried about transmission effect of uh, So, so much for the dynamics of private liquidity. And the second topic is the interrelationship between official and private liquidity. And this we will look at in normal times and in crisis times. So in normal times, it's pretty clear, and I think it's pretty standard. Everybody, uh, there have been many, many studies, including in this institution, of the kind of feedback loop that uh, private liquidity and official liquidity develop. You have reserve accumulation and uh, I've been, now for the last two, three years, I've been absolutely convinced that all our approach to reserve accumulation, or our theoretical models of reserve accumulation by emerging economies are totally obsolete. And that they don't give uh, accurate representations of the motives for emerging economy to accumulate reserves. And uh, basically the incentive is totally contrary to what uh, the private financial institutions have. If you don't have a lender of last resort, you overaccumulate. If you have a lender of last resort, you underaccumulate. That's, that's as simple as that. I mean, it's much more complicated than that. We developed that a little bit in the CGFS report. There are a, a comparison effect, relative position. But basically, my guess is that the reserve accumulation process is going to continue. It has huge systemic implication, and we don't have a good model to account for that. So that creates two feedback loops. The first one, which is absolutely evident, is that uh, central banks have a different risk preference from private investors. So when they leverage and deleverage, according to the mechanism described by uh, Robert McCullough in his paper, Risk On, Risk Off, they change, the, they shift. The world has such shift its preference towards risk-free assets. 
and that pushes, of course, the interest um, risk free assets down. And if this is, so that's the first feedback loop, and I think there are uh, very good empirical evidence in many studies to show that uh, it has a significant effect on interest rates on treasuries. Uh, the second feedback loop is a little bit more uncertain, but it's even more powerful, is that if this change in risk-free interest rate is interpreted by central banks as bringing the real equilibrium interest rate down, then they rationally react by practicing a more accommodative monetary policy. <laughs> And that more accommodative policy triggers the more traditional feedback loop where capital flows outside the reserve currency into emerging economies and accumulation of uh, financial uh, uh, reserve persists. So this is something which should maybe uh, more considered more carefully and that very nagging question of why low interest rates are so low for so long uh, should be considered, I think, as, again, as an urgent matter of research and whether central banks are right or not in interpreting those movements as movement in the the equilibrium real interest rates. In crisis time, do I have still five minutes? Three minutes? Hmm? Yeah. Yes, another five minutes. So, <clears throat> crisis time, what happens between private and official liquidity? Well, uh, as we all, all say, private liquidity collapses into, financial, into official liquidity. That's what happened, as Simon said yesterday, uh, with the Fed swaps in 2008. And that's what happened in the euro area with the target two balances. After all, target two balances was a fun official liquidity, although it's more than that, and it shouldn't be interpreted only as that. And those who interpret it only as that make a huge mistake. But it's also uh, a substitution of private liquidity uh, to the collapse of uh, private interbank intermediation inside the euro area. And also we had the flight, of course, in Treasury in 2008, 2009. So the big question, it's not a question for now. It's an interesting question for the future. Do we have a limit on that? And is the world going to be faced with a situation where private liquidity collapse and uh, there is no uh, in-place mechanism to provide sufficient official liquidity? I, I, I present very, very briefly uh, the yes and no answer. The yes answer is that there is a safe asset shortage and a kind of truth in dilemma on sovereign debt. Sovereign debt is the ultimate support for official uh, liquidity, and uh, to the extent that the governments are now very high debt, they, they are facing a triffing dilemma. The world is demanding more safe assets in the form of government debt, but of course the more the, the, this demand is satisfied by increased supply, the safety, the safety of those assets goes down, so this is a kind of triffing dilemma, uh, modern time. Uh, and second, uh, this is a case which has also been made by uh, my memory of self, reserve in the form of treasuries or central bank money and reserve currencies, actually in the form of treasuries, are not really outside liquidity. Because now those reserves account for a huge part of these outstanding amounts of uh, central bank debt. And then uh, if you try and imagine an aggregate liquidity shock where everybody wants to withdraw their reserves at the same time, then of course their liquidity might be compromised. And at least that would trigger an enormous kind of perturbation with unforeseen consequences, both of advanced and uh, emerging economies. And uh, uh, my former colleague Hiroshi Nakatsu made that point very, very subtly, but very clearly in a recent speech on the Lander of Us Resorts in, in Washington. So yes, there may be limits. And on the other side, you have an approach which has been developed by Gouran Shah and Olivier Jeanne, who's here today, which said, no, there's no limit because the central banks can always liquefy the government debt. And by expanding their balance sheets, the Gersa central banks can always provide the ultimate safe assets, which are the liabilities, which are on their balance sheet. So there is no limit to the production of ASAF in, 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 uh, in the world, uh, and at least in reserve currency or in big advanced economy. That calls into question, of course, the question of the fiscal implication of the central balance sheet, uh, consolidated balance sheet between the government and, and the central bank. And this is a question. <laughs> I will not venture too far because <laughs> Uh, Tom Sargent is there, and of course, uh, uh, it, uh, it, it is an, a matter on which he had, uh, he had made absolutely extraordinary contribution as far as several decades ago. I will come back to it in my, in my commentary in the panels, but my sense, and this is the second lesson I would draw from the Euro crisis, it's very difficult now, in the situation of public debt in major countries, to totally separate our problematic on liquidity provision and our problematic on fiscal sustainability. And the question of fiscal backing by, of liquidity provision by, by central bank in this country 
is a question that we will have to elaborate, face, and discuss in the future. And I make some comments in the commentary feature. So the conclusion now are very sort of provisional. We are looking at interdependence and the single financial system for the lenses of global liquidity. And that yields very important insight, which we, which we, which we cannot fully understand if we, if, we, if we look at other ways. I think also the, all the mechanisms which I described, with those feedback loops, with simplification, which unpredictability, which is the intrinsic endogeneity of private liquidity, makes the transmission mechanism hard, very difficult to predict. And that, in my view, makes the concern about what will happen in terms of non-conventional policies, whether some countries will expand, others will slowly, quote-unquote, exit or not. But I understand those concerns because, and I think even for those countries which practice non-conventional policy, taking into account what the general manager has said, uh, it, they, it, it is very good for them to reflect upon the all effects that those uh, changes in non-conventional policy will have all over the world because there will be a ripple back effect on their own economies. There are some difficult policy issues that we will discuss, I think, uh, later on in the panel. Uh, I'm aware that I'm finishing without giving all the answers, and that reminds me of a very good novel, by short story by Mark Twain, actually, in which he has a hero which gets entangled into a very complicated criminal plot. <laughs> and the plot gets very complicated as one chapter. And then you get at page 400, and then you turn the page and Mark Twain says, well, it's really getting too, too, too complicated for me. And I, I don't think I can get my hero out of the troubles, let him do it himself, and good luck. I hope I didn't put myself into such a situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Uh, Governor Lane will comment on this paper. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, uh, to uh, the Bank of Korea for hosting this uh, amazing uh, conference. It's, uh, I think it's been a very interesting uh, couple of days and, uh, and, uh, and uh, certainly uh, uh, appreciated the chance to participate in it. Now, uh, this session is uh, uh, obviously quite closely related to the topic of the next session, and so uh, I'm going to, um, uh, and, and Jean-Pierre's paper, uh, I think, covers a wide range of topics. I think, uh, I think it's very interesting in the, in the breadth of the, uh, of the topics that it pulls together. But I'm going to focus on just a couple of aspects of it now and then save uh, some of my uh, further uh, reflections for the, uh, for the panel discussion where both Jean-Pierre and I will have a chance to, uh, to have another uh, talk. And, uh, I was uh, just also going to comment that uh, um, in discussing this paper, maybe I feel I, I'm cast a little in the role of, uh, of Mark Twain's hero uh, of, of being left to, to, to sort it out. But, um, but, the, um, but um, I guess uh, one of the aspects I wanted to focus on uh, briefly was the, uh, which I think is a very uh, important aspect of this paper, which is, the, uh, uh, which is its emphasis on the interplay of public and private liquidity. And clearly that has uh, a number of different aspects to it. Um, one of uh, the aspects is the sense that the uh, uh, exceptional easing of monetary policy that we've been experiencing is really in large part a compensation for uh, what's been going on in the private sector, the implosion of some aspects of, uh, of shadow banking uh, in the, in the uh, global financial crisis and uh, the ongoing process of deleveraging in a number of the advanced economies. And those are processes which um, are a major uh, contributor to the weak global growth outlook that we, uh, the uh, scenario that we're currently experiencing. Um, but I guess uh, um, in thinking about the sort of private and public liquidity, I think it's, uh, I mean, a very useful uh, uh, starting point, I think, is, uh, is the uh, empirical regularity that, uh, the striking uh, empirical regularity that, that Gary Gordon uh, mentioned um, uh, yesterday, which is the, the uh, uh, constant share of safe assets uh, in relation to total assets. And clearly the question when looking at a ratio like that is, um, uh, is, is what, it, what is it that adjusts in order to, uh, in order to get that ratio to, uh, to hold true? And I can think of three possibilities. One is that uh, there's some adjustment of private liquidity to, um, to uh, compensate for any shortage of, of uh, public-generated liquidity. And the second is that um, the, uh, 
is, is that in the event that there's a shortage of, public, of, of private liquidity, as we've been experiencing in some countries in the wake of the crisis, then there's public policy action through monetary policy easing that then uh, squares that circle and, uh, and provides that adequate liquidity for the economy. The third possibility, of course, is that it's the denominator that adjusts, that it's total assets that adjust somehow, and possibly through some channels involving the real economy and, uh, and real economic activity. So, for example, if you have a shortage of, of, of uh, safe assets, does that generate um, a weaker uh, economic outlook, lower inflation, disinflation, or even deflation in such a way that, that also brings about adjustments in, in the uh, nominal value of assets in line with the total supply of safe assets. Now, clearly, we're not going to answer that question. Um, the question as to what's the relative mix of these three uh, adjustment uh, channels um, in bringing about that, that balance. But I think some of the discussion in Jean-Pierre's paper uh, 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 takes us a little bit in the direction of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of, of addressing that. Um, now, I guess the other, uh, the, the other uh, um, aspect that I wanted to focus on with regard to private liquidity was the regulatory agenda. And particularly, I think uh, one of the key uh, elements here is the, uh, is the global agenda with regard to shadow banking. And there, uh, there's a obviously a huge challenge. I think the way that it's sometimes been framed is that um, the uh, global community has kind of tackled the easy part, which is capital and liquidity requirements for for, uh, for banks, I mean, actually we'll hear that the liquidity part is not so easy, but, uh, but at least that that's, uh, in, in a sense, uh, uh, because it relates to a sector that's already heavily regulated, then uh, that's been a part of the policy agenda that's been, that's been tackled first. But then um, there's all the whole shadow banking issue, which is, it relates to a very heterogeneous set of uh, institutions and activities is something that uh, is the subject of active work at the, at the present time. Um, the goal is to have a coherent um, package of uh, policy responses to make shadow banking safe again um, by the time of the St. Petersburg summit this fall. Um, but um, the, the approach that's been followed is largely to divide the problem into five different parts. And, uh, and uh, uh, th those parts consist of um, um, uh, securitization, money market funds, uh, repo and securities lending, um, the links between shadow banking and, uh, and, and banking, and other shadow banking institutions comprising a wide range of different, uh, of different institutions. So, um, so in each of those areas, the approach that's been followed is to address um, specific aspects of risk which turned out to be uh, problematic in the context of the crisis. I mean, for example, in the context of securitization, the issue has been that many elements of the so-called safe assets that were created before the crisis turned out to be not so safe. In fact, because of the, uh, the tails turned out to be larger than uh, many of the purchases of those ad, uh, assets were aware of, or because uh, the pricing in, it depended in some way on guarantees uh, that those providing the guarantees may not have been fully aware of either. So. So in that area, there's been a, a drive towards uh, greater transparency, towards skin in the game for those originating to distribute, and, and various other reforms intended to address a specific source of risk. Similarly, with regard to repo markets, we've had work uh, trying to uh, uh, address the pro-cyclicality of margins and the, the tendency for margins and haircuts to shrink um, as you approach the uh, uh, as, uh, as you approach the peak of the financial cycle and then to widen out again when the system comes under stress. Now all of these are sensible, uh, broadly sensible initiatives, but I think what hasn't yet been done and needs to be done is to pull it all together into a more coherent picture of, um, of, of uh, what the shadow banking system is doing in, in terms of creating safe assets, creating liquidity in the global financial system, and really bringing that broader understanding of the role of shadow banking in the global economy uh, into sharper perspective and to, and to have that in some sense pervade the, uh, the, the, the policy agenda. Now that's obviously a tall order for this fall, but it certainly, um, it certainly is something that remains to be, uh, uh, to, to be reflected on further. Wanted to make a brief remark about exchange rates. I think we've had a lot of, uh, a lo and there, there's going to be more talk about exchange rates. I think in the final panel. But um, I guess uh, one of the uh, one of the suggestions has been that that with all the exceptional monetary policies, um, 
uh, uh, being implemented in a number of economies, uh, it introduces the, the potential for uh, instability in exchange rates or for even for indeterminacy in exchange rates. Now, what's striking, though, is that, um, is that in the countries or jurisdictions that have been implementing those policies, there's been actually, uh, I think, a surprisingly low degree of volatility of those exchange rates. But in view of the um, underlying volatility of the macroeconomic environment, it's, it's rather surprising to my mind that um, exchange rate volatility for the US and the Euro, uh, uh, Euro with regard to effective uh, exchange rates is actually, uh, has actually been, uh, been uh, declining to levels that are uh, similar to those during the Great Moderation. And uh, uh, that was also the case for Japan until a few months ago. But, uh, but as we know, that's not, uh, that hasn't been the case recently. But um, I think one, one, one question that that raises then is why, not, not why uh, policies affect volatility so much, but whether the, the degree of volatility uh, is, uh, um, is, is actually, uh, uh, whether, whether, you know, why there hasn't been more um, exchange rate volatility uh, stemming from the policies that are being implemented. Also, I'd like to make a very brief observation on the uh, on, on the reserve um, on, on reserve accumulation. And uh, clearly, uh, well, I know there are, there are uh, some people in this room who uh, who are very uh, who I mean, certainly looking at Olivia Jean, who's uh, who's who's uh, uh, got a very impressive. Uh, uh, a body of uh, work uh, analyzing and interpreting the uh, reserve accumulation behavior. But I think there's also generally, I, uh, I think, a, a consensus that reserve accumulation doesn't seem to be um, readily characterized in terms of, of, of a, a target level. And a number of the factors that I think might have been expected to reduce the appetite for reserve accumulation, for example, um, the, the sense that, um, uh, that uh, uh, providing more insurance through international institutions like through the IMF would actually provide less of an incentive to self-insure um, has turned out to be, uh, turned out not to give, take us very far in, in understanding the reserve accumulation that's taken place. So, um, I mean, clearly there's a need to understand the role of reserves um, more thoroughly, both in terms of its um, role in liquidity support for financial institution with uh, with foreign currency denominated liabilities and also the um, the, uh, the the need for uh, uh, for intervention, but I guess there are a couple of other explanations that maybe uh, should be should be borne in mind. And one is that there's some degree of relative uh, signaling involved in in reserve accumulation. That there's almost something in the nature of a beauty contest that uh, countries establish their financial soundness by uh, by having better reserve uh, larger reserve adequacy than than the average. And of course that would tend to lead to uh, to to uh, a uh, uh, to, to a process whereby reserves continue to accumulate. Of course, the other explanation is reserve accumulation is less of, a, of an objective in itself than a byproduct of other policies related to the exchange rate and, and the financial system. So those are just a few observations, but uh, uh, again, I, I will look forward to the, uh, the rest of the discussion and the, uh, and the panel to, uh, to discuss these issues further. Thank you. We have a second paper by Douglas Gay. Well, thank you. It's very nice to be here, especially uh, since I was invited before and um, some kind of approval, I guess, seeing that I was invited a second time. Um, but I thank the organizers. They've always, um, they've always put on a very good show and uh, treated everybody who attends this conference very kindly. So uh, what I'm talking about today is in the nature of some reflections on the relationship between economic theory and, and policy, in this case, liquidity regulation. Um, I think it was um, uh, Peter Drucker who said uh, that uh, economists always try to explain the past. Uh, he may have said the trouble with economists is they're always trying to explain the past. Well, from the point of view of a business consultant, I guess that is a problem. I'm not sure that it is from the point of view of people who are trying to do some kind of science. Um, but in any case, uh, when we come to financial regulation and you look at the, the history of how it's developed, it, it appears to be largely a, a matter of trial and error. Uh, theory is always trying to catch up with the regulators. Um, usually it starts with a crisis. The politicians say, this is terrible. Uh, we must do something to make sure this never happens again. So for example, in the 1930s, uh, in the United States, we saw the SEC, Glass-Steagall, uh, 
and uh, substantial reform of the way in which the Federal Reserve System worked. Um, in, the, in the financial crisis, of course, we got the Dodd-Frank Act as a result, and uh, it certainly had a big impact on, uh, on Basel III. So the theory of liquidity regulation is in its infancy, and there are a lot of questions that remain to be answered. And, and these are the standard questions that uh, come up whenever a theorist considers some, uh, some form of regulation. What are the market failures that necessitate this regulation? What are the costs and benefits of regulation? And, and what is the trade-off between efficiency and stability? Because any regulation has its own costs, um, so there's always a threat to efficiency uh, when we try to improve stability. Uh, but although theorists are still grappling with these questions, important decisions have already been made. Um, perhaps it may be too late to change them, but I happen to think that if we thought more carefully about them, we might avoid some uh, unintended consequences. So, so let me be, just begin with a, a little bit of, uh, of background. So the, the modern theory of financial, um, regula financial instability so, is this working? Yeah. began with um, Bryant and Diamond and Dibvig. And apart from their, their theory of, of bank runs, they, they introduced a number of, of useful ideas in trying to explain what banks are and what they do. They introduced a simple maturity structure of assets. They developed a theory of liquidity preference and they explained the role of banks as intermediaries that provide insurance against liquidity. In other words, these, ex these institutions exist because they provide efficient risk sharing. Um, and of course, they also provided this explanation for bank runs, although their theories were rather different. Um, so Franklin Allen and I, um, in a, a number of papers which spanned about 10 years, extended the, the basic model to look at uh, the interaction between banks and markets. And our models had several useful features for understanding macroprudential regulation. Uh, first of all, it was the use of financial markets to share risk and also to obtain liquidity. Um, we looked at models in which liquidation costs were endogenous rather than being taken as exogenous. And instability was driven by real shocks rather than um, by um, some kind of sunspot. And the relationship between liquidity preference and asset pricing always played a crucial role because liquidity preference drove the composition of portfolios that banks held and, and those compositions were then in turn determining the liquidity of the market. Um, so what did we learn from that exercise? Well, here, here are the, the basic conclusions. If, if banks are able to, to write complete contingent claim, uh, sorry, are able to write complete contingent contracts, and if, if the markets for sharing uh, aggregate risks are complete, then there are no bank failures, and risk sharing is incentive efficient. On the other hand, if markets for contingent claims are again complete, and intermediaries issue incompletely contingent uh, securities, for example, things with debt-like features, then risk sharing is nonetheless at least constrained efficient, where the constraint refers to the fact that your ability to write complete contracts is constrained. Um, and this means that the incidence of bank failures, which occur because they allow for greater contingency, is actually socially optimal. There's no, there's no market failure, even though you may have defaults and there may be rashes of defaults where several banks fail at the same time. It's only if the markets for these um, contingent claims are incomplete, that is you can't share some aggregate risks, that risk sharing is generically constrained and efficient. There, there's an interesting feature of these models though that it's not at all clear whether there's too much or too little liquidity uh, in, these, uh, in these models. In equilibrium, it all depends on the degree of risk sharing. But these results, uh, illustrate the crucial distinction between providing liquidity ex ante and obtaining it ex post. Ex post, when you have to go and sell assets on a potentially illiquid market, uh, the risk is that you're going to have a fire sale. And that's really where all the trouble arises. If you can arrange for delivery of liquidity in the state in which you need it, none of these properties arise. Um, as a side note, you might ask, well, why are markets incomplete? Um, in a, an early paper, um, which didn't seem to, um, I mean, it, it's well known among the cognoscenti, but it, it never uh, attracted any following and wasn't developed uh, 
subsequently, although it's an obvious uh, area for research. Uh, Sudipto Bhattacharya and I looked at um, a model where there was asymmetric information. So a particular bank's portfolio could not be observed, nor could the liquidity shocks to which it was subject. And in that world, provision of uh, complete uh, efficient liquidity uh, was impossible. But we were able to characterize the, the behavior of uh, uh, an optimal central bank as a mechanism that could be designed subject to incentive compatibility constraints and showed what you could do subject to these asymmetric information constraints. Um, again, it wasn't clear whether you're going to have too much or too little liquidity, um, whether liquidity insurance was incomplete or the holdings of, of liquid assets distorted too much, but uh, it all depended on uh, risk, risk aversion, very much like the, um, the paper that I was just discussing. So that's you know, a, a, a beginning, at least, on the question of what happens when you've got incomplete markets, uh, but people try to, to do the best they can, subject to some kind of um, uh, incentive constraint. Now, with that in, in, in the background, let me just emphasize what I think of as the importance of general equilibrium in talking about um, liquidity regulation. And of course, I'm only emphasizing this because in the regulations that have actually been uh, proposed, especially under Basel III, the, the focus is very much on individual banks and how you make an individual bank more resilient to some liquidity shock. Um, why are general equilibrium effects important? Well, basically because you can't understand the systemic component of liquidity problems by looking at a single bank. If we're talking about macroprudential regulation, we're really thinking about the system as a whole and as a system. We're not just thinking about the sum of individual banks. So making individual banks safer doesn't necessarily do the best job of making the system as a whole safer. Um, and it occurs to me that Part of the reason why the regulations seem to have developed this way is what I call the supervisory mindset, that many of the people involved in this process are involved in bank supervision in their normal jobs, and there their function is to go around individual banks and check for their safety and soundness. But making a single bank more resilient may make the, the financial system less resilient. Um, so, for example, if people have lots of liquidity but aren't allowed to use it because they're forced to hold a certain amount, um, then the, the, the market for assets, may, for even liquid assets, may be more volatile simply because these individuals can't become active in the market. But there remain many unanswered questions. You know, where are the micro foundations of the, of the proposals that have come out under Basel III? What's the objective function? It's not clear. Uh, what is the trade-off between stability and efficiency? And is it true that we really want to eliminate maturity transformation using wholesale funding, which is what the uh, liquidity coverage ratio as originally proposed seemed to be suggesting? Now, what, have, what, what do we know in, in the way of theory? There's been an awful lot of work done since the crisis, and, and much of it is exciting and, and very good work, although there's still much left to be done. Um, the most salient feature of the financial crisis as far as liquidity was concerned was the, the freeze of very important markets for funding uh, banks and other financial institutions, the repo market, the ABCP market, and so on. And a lot of work has been done uh, on the theory of market freezes. Um, I've listed a, a bunch of papers here. There are many others, um, but these are some that I find particularly interesting and particularly important. But let me just point out a couple. Um, John Genocopoulos' work on leverage cycles, I think, is remarkable. Um, if for no other reason than that he was way ahead of his time, way ahead of the crisis in, in pointing out the importance of haircuts and the use of uh, collateral to back lending. And, and what he's shown is that in markets where you have heterogeneous beliefs, and uh, as a result, you need to secure lending, um, you can get really large cycles uh, when the most optimistic uh, buyers, who happen to be the natural holders of these assets, default, and the assets then have to be held by less optimistic individuals who have to get their funding from even less optimistic individuals. And another uh, paper I'd like to refer to is one um, with uh, Viral Acharya 
and Yoro Mazur and myself, in which we talk about the fragility of, of um, borrowing, which is short term and backed by uh, assets, which don't necessarily suffer from asymmetric information or necessarily appear to be impaired, but are subject to rollover risk. Um, and this seems to be um, a leading characteristic of the markets in which we had the most difficulty during the crisis. So we, we've been accumulating lots of, um, of tools and models, but I don't think we're yet at the point where we can actually explain what optimal liquidity regulation is. But maybe some of these models will be useful for understanding the limitations of what has been proposed. Another um, important area of research has been on maturity transformation. Um, why do banks choose short-term financing? Um, you know, one problem that arises is uh, dynamic bank runs, as uh, Che and Hu have shown. Um, there are incentive effects of short-term debt, which um, various people, beginning with um, uh, Charlie Calamiris and Charlie Kahn, uh, followed by various others, have pointed out. Um, at the same time, there's the possibility that there's excessive short-termism, and uh, in, a, I think, a very remarkable paper, uh, Marcus Brunermeyer and his colleague Umke have shown that under certain circumstances, and, and it's, it's a rather subtle argument which requires you know, particular informational assumptions, and so you may get the maturity, ma maturity rat race or you may not, but under certain circumstances, it turns out that you can entice some of your lenders to, uh, to take shorter term debt, and as a result, they get, appear to get a certain benefit from uh, being more, more short term because short term means that you're more senior to the longer term investors and under certain circumstances, you can renegotiate your debt with the short term holders uh, at the expense of the long term holders. Unfortunately, this process, when it continues to its limit, has everybody going to the shortest possible term and the, the sort of paradoxical part of this result which suggests that maybe someone's leaving money on the table, is that it's the, uh, the borrower who ends up suffering um, all of the costs from this maturity rat race, even though it's the borrower who began the whole process. Um, but that's a, a theoretical uh, sideline. I'll ignore it here. Um, so that's some of what we know. Um, what I'd like to do in the rest of my time is just talk briefly about some recent work I've been doing with Piero Gattardi um, that, that deals with fire sales and the effect it has on firms' capital structure. And the fire sales are, are relevant to liquidity regulation because it raises the question, you know, what are the costs of default and how does this relate to the liquidity of markets? Um, but this paper is also relevant to questions of what's the optimal capital structure in a general equilibrium model. So in, in this paper, default is costly because a firm's assets could be sold at fire sale prices um, if there's um, a failure of the, of the firm, which leads to liquidation. And fire sales arise when assets are sold on Ill illiquid markets. Now, of course, this is very different from a Modigliani-Miller world in which capital structure is indeterminate and really doesn't affect the value of the firm. But we study a model in which the optimal capital structure is determined by the trade-off between the tax advantages of debt and the risk of liquidating assets in the, in the fire sale. However, markets are incomplete in the sense that we only allow spot markets for goods and assets. Firms are financed using short-term debt and equity, and firms pay a distortionary corporation tax, but interest income is exempt. That's the usual uh, tax hedge of, of debt. And in the event of default, firms are forced into bankruptcy and their assets are liquidated. So that liquidation is subject to a finance constraint. Think of this as cash in advance. If you want to buy up these liquidated assets during the bankruptcy process, you have to provide cash rather than IOUs backed by the future returns of these assets. And it's this finance constraint that is essential in uh, supporting the fire sale. Um, so we use a, a two-sector infinite, uh, infinite horizon growth model where there are two goods at each date, a perishable consumption good, and a durable capital good. Now, capital goods are produced subject to decreasing returns to scale using consumption as the sole input. 
and producers maximize profits at each date and distribute the profits to the consumers who own the firms. And the decreasing returns to scale production function has the effect of, of bounding investment, uh, much as adjustment costs do in a, in a Tobin Q model. Now, investment in capital is irreversible. The consumption good is produced subject to constant returns to scale using capital as the sole input. And one unit of capital produces A units of consumption goods and depreciates at the rate one minus theta bar on average. And then there's a long-lived consumer of the sort that's very familiar from any uh, standard macro model. You can think of this uh, except for the, the capital goods producing sector as being like an AK growth model. So the capital goods sector consists of a continuum of firms with identical technologies. Since production is instantaneous, there's no finance required. But in the consumption goods sector, uh, there's a continuum of producers with identical technologies, and capital is subject to random appreciation, but there's no aggregate uncertainty. So the, um, the average value of these, um, these factors theta is going to be equal to theta bar. And since capital is long lived, they have to issue um, debt and equity in order to, to finance capital purchases. Now the, the crucial element in this model, which explains why there's default and why uh, there's uh, inefficient liquidation, is that each period, because there's short term debt, the, the firm has to either roll over or renegotiate the debt. So we set up this simple game in which in the first subperiod, uh, a firm uh, makes a take it or leave it offer to the claimants and says, we re roll over the, the debt on these terms. And if it can't do that, then it has to declare bankruptcy. And then in the next subperiod, the bankrupt firm has to issue all of its assets for sale. And in the last subperiod, uh, everything is cleared up. That's the, the settlement period. Now it turns out that there's no, um, uh, that there always exists um, an equilibrium in which you can renegotiate the debt if theta is greater than some particular value, let's call it ZT, of the variable theta. And the, um, the face value of the debt per unit of capital is called DT and is defined by this equation where A is the return to a unit of capital and then QT times ZT is the price you get on the liquidation market for selling, this, um, for selling the amount of capital that remains uh, when theta is equal to ZT. So basically this just says that there's going to be a subgame perfect equilibrium in which renegotiation succeeds if and only if the firm is, um, is solvent when you value its, um, its capital at the price Q. Then in the liquidation period, it turns out that um, the, the, the sale of this capital is going to be constrained by the amount of cash that's available in the market. So capital can only be bought in this market by the solvent firms. Um, and the amount of capital that they have is the, the output K times the um, integral from ZT to one, this is the range of firms that are solvent, times their average capital stock KT, which is just equal to A times the measure of the solvent firms times KT. And the amount of capital that's going to be supplied is simply the integral of theta T KT over the range of firms that are insolvent, those from lying from zero to ZT. So the market clears at the price QT, if QT times the quantity of capital for sale is less than or equal to the amount of cash held by these solvent firms. And equality is going to hold, it's going to hold with equality if QT is strictly less than VT, which is the economic value of these, uh, of these assets. Now in equilibrium, it's going to turn out that this constraint is always binding and QT is always less than VT because, the, the, um, uh, because of the tax on, on equity. So I'm just going to skip over specification of the, of the tax um, and just make a couple of observations about equilibrium. So it, it turns out that we, in equilibrium, we're always going to have a fire sale in the event of default. That is, QT, the price of liquidated capital, is always less than its economic value, the value which it's, it sells at the end of the period. And it, default always occurs for the typical firm with a probability strictly between zero and one. <clears throat> 
And, and to see that that's so, you just have to consider what would happen if you had 100% debt finance or 100% equity finance. With 100% debt finance, uh, since the firm gets zero profit after you've taken a care of the returns to equity and to debt, uh, with 100% debt finance um, and Theta having full support, uh, the probability of default would be zero, so there's no one to pick up the pieces and the price of liquidated capital goes to zero. Well, that can't be an equilibrium. On the other hand, if you have 100% equity finance, then the, um, the uh, liquidated capital market is going to clear trivially with no trade, QT is equal to VT, but then there's no cost to default, so you could obviously get a benefit from the tax hedge if you just levered up a little bit. So neither of those could be uh, equilibria. So this, this tells you that as long as you have a positive tax rate on equity returns, then you must have a default in equilibrium, and there must be a fire sale whenever there's default. So one friction or one distortion in this model is going to lead to, uh, to two. Um, let, let me skip over the, the, uh, the firm's problem and the, the consumer's problem, which are entirely, the consumer's problem is entirely standard, the firm's problem isn't, but it, it's rather technical and not that interesting. Um, so let me say something about, um, do I want to say something about non-steady state paths? No, I think I'll skip over this too. Oops. Uh, okay, let me just say something about uh, efficiency. So it, it's not surprising that if we put tau equal to zero, so there's no, um, there's no tax on equity, then you could reach the first best, in effect, by just using all equity finance. But if we assume that tau is positive and ask, how could limited interventions in the market improve things? In particular, what would happen if we were to force firms to have a higher break-even level, which most of the time is like saying having a higher debt-to-equity ratio? You might think that would make things worse. Um, there certainly seems to be a, a prejudice against using too much uh, debt in company finance. But here, it seems like it always makes things better. And in fact, you can approach the first best if you keep pushing the, the, um, the debt equity level up to 100% uh, equity financing. As I say, that's not an equilibrium. It's an equilibrium relative to some imposed choice of the debt equity ratio. So there's not too much risk or too much debt in the economy. There's too little. So that's one of the kind of surprises that comes out when you think about this kind of general equilibrium uh, setup where, where you've made the costs of, of default um, endogenous. Okay. Um, so one of the, the limitations of the model I've described so far is that um, there's no way that people can choose to hold a more liquid asset and try to smooth out some of those fluctuations in asset prices uh, between observing Q in one period and V in the other. You might think that some kind of arbitrage would take place. Well, we can't do that because there's only one asset in this economy and you don't get to choose whether you default or not. That's all determined by theta, which is exogenous. But suppose we introduced a safe technology a way of using capital that produced a return, say, B, for sure, and had a certain uh, discount, a certain depreciation rate, so that after production you're left with theta bar units of capital. So this looks rather like the other one, except we've taken the risk out and we've reduced the return a bit so that it doesn't dominate the other asset. Well, in this case, it turns out, although it's not obvious, that it's never optimal for firms to use both technologies. They do best by specializing in one or the other. So we have a fraction L of the firms using the risky technology and one minus L using the safe technology. And, uh, sorry. Um, so suppose that the risky firms choose some Z star to maximize the value of the firm. And the safe firms, of course, are gonna use 100% debt financing because that minimizes their tax liability. Then it turns out that if we simply require equal expected returns on both types of, of investment, that this determines the value Q star that can be observed in equilibrium. And then we can just write down the um, adaptation of the market clearing conditions in order to get the, um, the um, 
you know, the, the, the equilibrium conditions we need to solve for this equilibrium. Oops. Um, but the main result I want to point out is this, uh, this welfare result. If the return on the safe asset, B, is too low, then uh, it's just not going to be used, and you're essentially back into the original one technology economy. There's a critical value, B bar, such that if B is greater than this level, then you want to use the safe technology. But if you look at a value of B that's greater than B bar, but not too much bigger, then we can show in general that that's always going to be worse for the, um, for the, uh, the representative agent than an economy without this asset. In other words, introducing a liquid asset, even though it reduces the scope of fire sales, actually makes everybody worse off. Um, um, yeah, now that's a local result. Let me just show you a simple example, numerical example, to suggest that in fact the result may be uh, much stronger than that. Um, this curve shows steady state consumption as a function of the value of B, and at the left-hand side of this curve, B is equal to B bar. That is, people are just indifferent between using this technology and not using it. On the right-hand end, you've got B equal to A, so the safe technology completely dominates the risky technology, and it's not surprising then that you're going to do better because you've got rid of the risk, which causes the inefficiency, but you have the same return. But for most of the, the range in between, you can see that you're actually worse off with the, uh, with the, risky, uh, with the safe uh, liquid technology. Right. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. I've, I've uh, perhaps suggested a few directions in which we can perhaps do more research, but I hope that the fact that you know, so, much of these, so many of these results that you get in, in general equilibrium don't on the surface seem to accord with uh, some of the ideas backing our uh, current regulation. Um, might suggest to you that, that this research could be valuable for uh, reforming regulation of liquidity. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas. And the floor is now to Akito Matsumoto. Uh, thank you very much, organizer and Bank of Korea for hospitality and uh, organizing this great uh, uh, conference. Um, and this, first, uh, I have to tell this is my own view, not IMF. Uh, so I'm not going to put any IMF uh, stamp or anything uh, after this. And uh, as Japanese, let me apologize. Uh, and uh, I'm going to discuss only the second part of uh, Douglas' uh, uh, presentation uh, about uh, modeling. So it's not much about regression part, but it's about the uh, uh, model part. So this paper is very good in a sense. It, this is great reminders for me. Uh, it's important reminder that the importance of theory to evaluate policy. So the simple question is: Is stability good, or is providing liquidity good when bankruptcy is costly due to liquidity constraint? So the, this simple question that without theory or models, you know, one might say yes as you know, this is particular uh, convention of wisdom. But this paper shows actually the answer is no. So this is very good, uh, you know, the counter example of, uh, to the to convention of wisdom. So this, uh, this is the summary of model. So this capital depreciation there, and depreciation rates are run across firm. And this is the only source of uncertainty but no aggregate uncertainty. So farms with larger depreciation can pay off debt, so there's liquidation happening, and the liquidating farms have to sell their capital only for cash buyers. So the, this liquidity constraint is gonna cause fire sales. And then the other ingredient is distortionary tax. And this is very simple model, but it can show the key result. So this is very beautiful model. So key result here is that uh, in modular mirror bar that the capital structure is not determined, but with tax, uh, farms use debt, 
and with the cost default of FireSauce, uh, firms try to use equity financing. If you have two, then you can get a uh, uh, good or nice unique interest solution. But it's not nice in terms of welfare because uh, competitive equilibrium does not coincide with prior to equilibrium or even the um, constraint the efficiency. So in his model, there's too much stability, too little investment, and in an extended part, that a simple liquidity provision don't gonna work. So this is the key result of the uh, model. Actually, let me say one thing here, because people in the IMF or uh, people in the central banks tend to love stability so much, and we tend to forget actually that uh, the trade-off between, the, you know, Douglas said it's a uh, trade-off between stability and efficiency, or in some sense, we should look at stability and growth, and uh, Bob Lucas, you know, the statement is that, you know, a little bit of stability can be, you know, sacrificed if you can get, you know, a little bit of growth. So the growth is more important, and this is kind of, you know, the, some mechanism maybe here too. So this is a great model in that respect as well. So here, liquidity constraints cost coming from that uh, uh, cash constraint during liquidation process. So the question here is, you know, as uh, he showed that the provision of safe technology helps because uh, it's get, people can hold that uh, safe technology to make cash ready for the liquidation sales. But it's not, and it even make an agent pass off because safe technology reduces the basic investment, risky technology provides higher return. So here, the one way to think liquidity provision is that uh, during bankruptcy process, so in, in, in the model that's called the sub-period B, if they provide uh, cash to the buyer, then it's, it's trivially less to the efficiency as it brings fire sales price up to the, the economic value of VT. So there's the, you know, this model also shows the importance of uh, where exactly the constraint, where, the, where exactly you need provide liquidity. And so it is not simple, you know, safe technology type, you know, liquidity. It's not the um, liquidity for safe asset, but it's rather liquidity in the risky asset market because it's distressed asset uh, during bankruptcy process. And uh, let me promote my own work that uh, I also discuss uh, the importance of distinguish uh, fund availability in a safe and risky asset market. And I realize actually in this conference that many people can separate liquidity in uh, core versus non-core, official versus private. And uh, the Ungi also distinguished in a three way and exogenous, endogenous, and risk bus. So there may be some kind of common ground there, but this model is kind of one way to look at from the, the lens of model, because Typically, we kind of jumping off kind of the conventional wisdom and oh, let's look at just safe and uh, risky, but this model has a theoretical foundation, so it's gonna be helpful. So the interesting twist in this model is that uh, uh, the manager of this farm try to avoid fire sales because they, he want to maximize the value of the farm. But if manager, is, can try to take advantage of uh, his salary structure. Let's say that uh, he's not gonna get paid off when he's bankrupt, but if uh, he can get money uh, if they have profit, then this agent might actually do the uh, leverage up. Then actually this is uh, welfare improving in this particular setup because the higher debt will improve welfare as uh, shown in the example. 
So this is the interesting uh, observation that if you have uh, already strange, or already um, not inefficient, then adding some other bad elements can actually improve the um, welfare of the agent. So this is a very beautiful model. Uh, so we really need to understand theory, but we also have to understand the limitation of the model to draw the policy conclusion, because we can't say that this, the providing safe technology is bad, that's it. No, we can't do that. So we, we ho also have to think about uh, additional things to consider, you know, to draw the policy uh, conclusion. For example, in this model that uh, there's no aggregate risk, so the agent's not gonna suffer much because of uh, any fluctuation in the aggregate risk. Um, for Kiyotaki type uh, costly bankruptcy, uh, in a sense that the loss of technology, so that uh, when bankrupt happen, then you cannot transfer the technology so well because you are the expert of using particular machine, but the, the somebody who bought this particular machine has to run the how to use it, so there's loss of technology. Um, and also, we also have to think about fire sets in the security market. So these things, uh, of course, you know, we have to consider. Uh, beyond the model, of course, um, theory is still far from uh, answering practical questions in many ways. Um, although we really need a theory to pin down the welfare implication, uh, so we really want uh, the scale to work a lot so that we can get uh, uh, more welfare implication. Um, for example, uh, capital fraud to small country related to liquidity provision by the major central bank. If so, how it's related? What should the central banks of small country do when they are facing the large surge of capital inflows? As uh, Jonathan uh, presented, you know, there's a scope of uh, capital controls in some cases if it's the unwarranted external adjustment or the if it's uh, affecting um, financial stability. And after I did, I'm here for the entire session and the, I still can't have a clear grasp of global liquidity. We, we got several ideas and uh, the, but pro, and it's probably true that it's not one. There's many ways to define it, and you have to define in a way appropriate to answer the particular question. And in, in that each case, it's, there are many ways to measure it. So let me conclude. So the paper is very interesting, and it's very nicely written, so it's very easy to follow. Uh, so I recommend you to take a look at it. Um, and model is important to guide the policy, but any model have limitation. So you also have to understand well what is the limitation and what is the assumption there. So we learn from experience. Uh, so empirical study can help to extract wisdom from experience, but it should also buried in some models if this uh, conclusion is uh, just a superficial observation or uh, it, it's in general or we, we, if we have some uh, missing element. So we should keep asking relevant questions with theory in our minds, understanding its usefulness and also limitation. Thank you. Thank you, Akito. Uh, for the sake of, of time, I, I propose that we take a round of questions before we, I, I give back the floor to, to the two authors. Please raise your flags. <laughs>
Okay. okay. I I think uh, this uh, paper of by uh, Douglas Gale is is a very interesting paper, and I think um, certainly I would agree that liquidity regulation requires much much more analysis, and and uh, therefore these contributions are very very important. So um, it. it at some point of time, it was felt that it was needed liquidity regulation. Perhaps we didn't have all the theory behind it. Although I think that uh, I would say that regulators give a little bit more thought that you seem to credit them uh, in, in, in making the, um, the liquidity ratios. But I would like to say just a few th uh, things. First, uh, uh, they can, uh, you said, why to hold liquidity if they cannot use it? This is not the case. It can be used, and this is one of the things that the liquidity ratios have clarified. When necessary, liquidity can and should be used, reducing the ratios below what it is considered the, uh, uh, appropriate in normal times. Eliminate maturity transformation. I don't think the purpose is to eliminate maturity transformation. It's to limit maturity uh, transformation. And the experience was that the liquidity was, uh, before the crisis, was taken for granted. And therefore, the idea is that this should be compensated to some extent. So there, to some extent, there were significant market failures um, uh, there. So you said, do nothing to address market freezes. If, if I understand market freezes, I think to have some kind of buffers, to have longer maturity on the liability structure of financial intermediaries will help significantly to um, reduce the possibility of these market freezes. I think I need to study more, much more the model. It's not that I can intuitively start to argue about uh, the model. I don't know how this model would, um, would uh, work with uh, counterparty risk. How this fits there, uh, but this is part of the problem that uh, has emerged at some point of time, the idea that you don't want to lend to other in financial intermediaries and you cut uh, the, the, the lending to them, the interbank lending. I think one of the cases that, that we have seen and that it would be good how this would be explained or what contribution would be for the model is the case, for example, of the banks lending to mortgages of 20 years, uh, financing themselves in the interbank at a few months, and then suddenly there is a uh, concern about the counterparty risk of this bank, and it's completely, the financing is completely freezed. So um, these are the kind of questions that when you were uh, presenting your case, uh, I was uh, thinking, and certainly uh, models that could help us in understanding these elements would be extremely, extremely helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Go on, Choi. Uh, I have a question <coughs> for Douglas Gill's, uh, uh, Professor Gill's uh, presentation. Um, as regards um, liquidity reg regulation, uh, actually uh, we need to consider heterogeneity of uh, uh, commercial banks. Uh, different uh, banks might have a different uh, capacity um, uh, in dealing with the shocks in terms of uh, capital structure and uh, uh, their management skills. So if uh, there are uh, uh, banks as, uh, such uh, that uh, have uh, uh, capital purpose more than uh, required, and then uh, uh, such banks might have incentive to increase leverage, um, so that there might be uh, some unexpected uh, uh, countervailing effects uh, from the banking side. So uh, as, uh, as a whole, in that case, uh, one size fits all regulation may result in uh, some leverage increase in the banking sector, so that the welfare or the resilience of the banking system could be a bit uh, undermined. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no other questions, let me add <laughs> uh, mine. Uh, one to, to Douglas. Uh, I think your, your mother is very, very nice in describing how the corporate income tax affects, uh, affects, affects various things. 
uh, but so much of the model re relies on the corporate income tax that it would be good if we knew a bit more about how changes in the corporate income taxes would change the results. Uh, do lower CIT rates uh, involve lower debt levels, and, but, but also, I guess, lower excess? Uh, it's just what, what we, we would imagine, but uh, it probably also involves that then uh, the, 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 um, the negative effects of providing more liquidity are, are going down as, uh, as the corporate income tax rates are, are going down, which is the kind of secular trend uh, we, are, we are observing. And, and, and to, to Jean-Pierre, I was wondering whether this, this traditional distinction between um, public and private uh, liquidity provision, whether it's blurred in, in any way by, by the, the new schemes put in place by, by the UK or Japan, the fund for, for lending schemes, and, and whether we, we are not seeing a, a way of, uh, of um, uh, for central banks to, to start playing the, the role of lender of last resort, also for non-financial corpor uh, non corpor corporations. Uh. And does it change anything to your to the analysis? All right, I'll, I'll try to answer all these questions if I can remember them. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, to thank Akito for um, his very uh, complimentary discussion of my paper and and for pointing out its limitations. Um, I mean, this is not a, a model that I would propose seriously as the basis for, um, for policy regulation. It's really just a way of thinking about some aspects of the problem, and uh, much more work is is um, is required. And you know, I, I've written a number of other papers on the general issue of, of liquidity regulation, and um, you know, one can get different results with different assumptions. But I think to uh, to paraphrase Groucho Marx, if you don't like my model, I've got others. Um, and um, I, I agree with, with, with Jaime that um, you know, the, the current version of these um, uh, regulations uh, proposed by Basel does allow for the use of uh, liquidity in some cases. It's not as extreme as the original version that came out of the working group or as is described by Goodhart's taxi. Um, but what I worry about is that if this is uh, seen as, as something that banks can only do in extremis, then there's going to be a stigma attached, much as there is a stigma attached to going to the discount window. And so for practical purposes, it may not be something that uh, people can uh, count on doing, and, and they won't be using this liquidity to supply it to the market for, um, for, for banks that are in need. Um, you know, I, I think it, it's it's arguable, uh, you know, whether this, um, um, uh, you know, wh whether this um, uh, regulation of the liquidity coverage ratio is really trying to ban maturity transformation. I, what what I said was it seemed to, it was going to ban maturity transformation, uh, funded by the house the, the wholesale sector, uh, the, sorry the wholesale markets, um, or at least restrict it to high quality liquid. Um, assets, which, for which, of course, there would be no, no real profit and no, um, no real economic rationale. So maybe it goes too far to say that they're trying to ban maturity transformation, but at least as far as wholesale funding and the, um, the funding of, of longer-term illiquid assets goes, it's, it seems very difficult uh, to do under the current uh, regulations. Um, again, a clarification. When I, when I said that these regulations don't do anything about market freezes, I mean, they may, they may ameliorate some of the problems caused by market freezes, but they don't actually do anything to prevent market freezes themselves. Um, and one possible um, uh, you know, direction in which we might move to try to make these freezes um, less likely would be to, um, to create different kinds of banks which are more transparent and less likely to be frozen out of the market. Um, that, that's a, another subject, but um, I mean, you know, it, it's a bit like taking the whiskey bottle away from the alcoholic. You may have stopped him getting drunk, but you haven't actually you know, cured his alcoholism. So um, by 
you know, preventing people from using wholesale markets or having to use that funding only to, to purchase uh, liquid assets. You may have prevented the worst consequences of market freezes, but you haven't actually stopped the market freezes themselves. Um, you know, I agree about uh, counterparty risk and also your point about um, heterogeneity of banks. Again, it's just a simple model and uh, doesn't include everything. So again, there's much more work to be done. Okay. Yeah, on, <clears throat> on your question about the, the funding for lending scheme, uh, I think it's a, it's a targeted public liquidity provision uh, for funding a targeted credit system. So it's basically it's basically that. Um, whether it will work or not, it's very important to know that it goes with other measures which have been less advertised, like zero capital charge on, on those new exposures. Uh, whether it will work or not, I mean, uh, I think the, the whole stance of policy is trying to uh, uh, fight the headwinds coming from increased risk aversion in the banking sector with, with, with liquidity provision. And those two forces balance each other. Uh, it's the general stance of central banking liquidity provision. It's attempting there on a targeted way to uh, target funding to, to, to small and medium sized uh, uh, enterprises. I think it's too soon to tell whether it works, but uh, it's, it, it's, it's the whole idea, I think. Uh, I just want also to thank uh, Tim for, for, for his comments. Uh, I think he put the question on reserve accumulation in a much uh, clearer way uh, than, I, and, than I did, and I fully agree with what, what, what he said. Uh, I think the, the works on reserve have been very important, but we, we may need to build on those works to, to, to go a further stage for the future. And uh, maybe I could try and give a personal answer to uh, the puzzle and the question he asked about why the exchange rate between the major currencies have been so, have shown so little volatility. Uh, I think I, I, I mentioned that briefly in one of my slides is uh, if you have a expected uh, zero interest rates between the major currency for an extended period of time, there's absolutely no remuneration for taking risk in cross-border exposures and taking position in exchange rates. So there's no incentive to take position on exchange rates. So uh, unless you have a very uh, uh, strong factors uh, which influence your risk uh, perception and risk premia, uh, that could, in my view, explain stability. Whereas if you look uh, between uh, advanced and emerging economies, then you have a remuneration for taking risk because the interest rates perspectives and the, the, the returns are uh, may be seen as divergent. Or over uh, over the next few years, so that's that, that would be my explanation for the stability uh, between the major currency, the relative stability between the major currency. Well, I think we are reaching the end of, of the session. Let me thank uh, the two authors and uh, the two discussants for for very help helpful discussion. Thank you. <laughs>